Hey Team Bio, welcome to your first screencast of the second semester. Um, okay, so a screencast is where I talk to you and um, I write things down, I highlight things, um, and uh, I speak. Um, uh, trying to do that all at the same time, sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, and they're useful because you can watch them at any speed. Um, they will be there for you on the internet at any time. So say you want to review for a test or um, a final, the screencast is there uh, for you to watch again. Um, and you can also watch them at any speed that works for you. So if you're someone who picks up on things really quickly, um, and can watch these at 1.5 speed, that's great. If you're someone who uh, processes a little bit more slowly, you can watch these at half speed, um, you can pause, you can rewind. Um, and so I think they're a useful learning tool. Um, okay, so let's get right into it. I want you to follow along and um, as I draw and highlight, I want you to take notes just like you would if we were in class. Okay. Today's um, lesson is going to be about energy coordinate diagrams. Um, specifically, we're going to be looking at the rate of a reaction with and without an enzyme. Uh, and before we begin that, we're going to talk about, well, what is an enzyme? Well, most enzymes are made up of proteins, and you all know that the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. They are the monomers of proteins. There are um, 20 different types of amino acids. Eight of them are essential, meaning that they have to be eaten by humans. They can't be produced internally, but the rest can be produced. Um, so they are, oops, I meant to say, amino acids are the monomer of proteins. When you uh, string a bunch of amino acids together, you get a polypeptide. And this is the polymer of protein. Um, but when it's a long straight chain, this polypeptide is not functional in a living system. In order to be transformed from a polypeptide into a functional protein, it needs to be folded. And we're going to be talking uh, pretty extensively about how proteins are folded and how their shape informs their function. Um, okay, so a functional protein needs to be folded um, in order to go from a polypeptide, a straight chain of amino acids, to being functional. Um, and so some proteins uh, become enzymes. Well, what are enzymes? Enzymes are what we call biological catalysts. Um, a catalyst is something that speeds up, I guess I should put the arrow under catalyst, not biological. A catalyst speeds up the rate of a reaction. Um, and it does this by lowering the activation energy. The activation energy is kind of the energy required to get the reaction going. Um, the other thing that is always true of a catalyst, catalyst is that it's not consumed in the reaction. So in a typical reaction, we have reactants that are converted to products. And over time, uh, we use up all the reactants as they're all converted to product. Um, but a catalyst is not going to be consumed. It can be used again and again and again and again. Um, so um, we call um, enzymes biological catalysts because they are um, they speed up the rate of reaction. They do so by lowering the energy of activation, the, ac the energy required to get a reaction going, and they are not consumed in the reactions that they catalyze. Um, okay, there are two broad classes of reactions. 
One is called an exothermic reaction, and an exothermic reaction is going to be a, a reaction that releases energy. If you look at the energy coordinate diagram here, where we have energy on the y-axis and time on the x-axis here, you see that here we have the reactants. And over here, we have the products. And the reactants start out at higher energy than the products end at. So the difference between the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products here, we call this delta H. And in this case, it is negative because the reactants start out at a higher energy than the products. And this means energy is released. And usually this energy is released in the form of heat. Um, so an exothermic reaction will release heat as it's happening. Um, an endothermic reaction uh, it requires energy in order to run. So if we look at our reactants here and our products here, you can see that the products have a higher energy level than the reaction reactants. The difference between these energy levels is also delta H. And in this case, it's positive. And so here, we're going to need an input of energy in the reaction in order to um, have the reactants um, get to the level of energy as the products. Um, OK, so two great examples of um, exothermic and endothermic reactions are cellular respiration, where glucose is combusted with oxygen, molecular oxygen, to make CO2 uh, water and energy is released. So here is the energy difference between the reactants and the products, and this is the amount of energy released. This would be a negative delta H. Photosynthesis this is an example of an endothermic reaction where the reactants that we start out with, uh, carbon dioxide, water, um, needs an input of energy, this is energy coming from the sun, in order to build glucose and molecular oxygen. So this would have a positive delta H. Um, okay, so you might notice in both of these curves um, that the uh, total amount of energy um, needed to get this reaction going is higher than the energy at which um, either reaction starts or ends. And the difference between um, the amount of energy um, in the reactants and the amount of energy required to get the reaction going, this is what's called the activation energy. And uh, a great example of this is um, a piece of firewood. A piece of firewood contains a lot of energy. Um, and, but in order to release that energy, you have to add uh, some heat to the system in order to get it to burn. Um, once it's burning, um, it can sustain, it's like putting in the um, amount of energy it needs to continue burning, um, but you needed to provide that spark, that initial activation energy, in order to get the reaction to run at all, because the log is not just going to spontaneously combust. There's a pretty big um, activation energy required to get a log to start burning, but once it does, a lot of energy can be released. Um, and the same is true here. The difference between um, the total amount of energy needed to get this reaction to happen, and the products is called the activation energy. Now, we said before that a biological catalyst um, speeds up the rate of reaction by lowering the activation energy. Um, so this black curve in both of these lines is showing us the rate of reaction 
without an enzyme. But now we're going to add in the rate of the reaction with the enzyme. And it looks something like this. We start out with the same level of energy for the reactants. Oops, I want to add blue here. But the amount of energy required to get the reaction going is not as much. Um, the, uh, the enzyme, oops, Sorry, guys. The enzyme has lowered the energy of activation for this reaction. And so now the activation energy is only this much. It takes less energy to get the reaction started. Um, and if we were graphing out an endothermic reaction, it's going to look something like this. Oops over here. The reaction is going to proceed faster because it has a lower activation energy here. Okay, um, so how do enzymes accomplish this? How do they lower the energy of activation? And the answer is um, by positioning their reactants in a very specific way in order to get the reaction to happen. And we're going to talk more about how that happens in class tomorrow. Um, but for today, this is all you need to know and understand this idea that an enzyme is a biological catalyst. It's going to speed up the rate of the reaction by lowering the amount of energy needed to get that reaction started or to complete that reaction. And it's not going to be consumed, so it can be used over and over and over again to catalyze many hundreds or thousands or millions of reactions. Okay, that's all.